what I feel is the easiest example. And I'm going to provide you with names for different kinds of collisions as well. But I want you to understand that they're not going to name these. But if they do say the name in the problem, you'll have to know what that means for the result. So here's the first one. We're going to have one car with a mass of five kilograms traveling at 10 meters per second collide with a 10 kilogram car that's at rest. These two cars undergo a perfectly inelastic collision. Perfectly inelastic. Now, before we go too deep into this, the word inelastic means that kinetic energy is not conserved. I'm choosing my words carefully. Please make sure you choose your notes carefully. Kinetic energy is not conserved. Energy is always conserved. We're saying that in an inelastic collision, kinetic energy is converted to some other form of energy. Momentum will still be conserved. Momentum is not related directly to energy. But the kinetic energy is not. Perfectly means the two objects instantaneously join together. They use the word instantaneously here to indicate that the cars don't bounce around wasting energy. They merely join together and become one object with a combined velocity. So in, an inelastic, in a perfectly inelastic collision, the objects stick together after the collision. The word perfectly is what says that. Perfectly means they join together. Now, usually they'll just say that the two objects couple or stick together or something like that. They'll give you something. In these problems, momentum is a conserved quantity, which means that the momentum of the first object plus the momentum of the second object before the collision has to equal the momentum of the first object plus the momentum of the second object after the collision. That's what a conservation of momentum problem is about. Now, something I tried to impart to you last week, or maybe I didn't and wanted to, is that when we talk about collisions, we are really trying to focus to the instant before they touch and the instant after. There can be lots of other things happening, but collisions we talk about are instantaneous, meaning we're talking about the, the instantaneous moment before they touch and the instantaneous moment afterwards. It's important that you get that in your notes to understand that there could be something else happening that is changing the momentum of the system. But for the impact or for the point of the collision, we're talking about just the moment before and just the moment after. Now, I know you're, you've got to be wondering what, what the heck I'm trying to say. And, and let me just for a moment. Now, in this problem, there's really not a lot to do. And in your notes, if you want some problem solving skill, Momentum can only generate one equation. Momentum can only generate one equation, which means there, can, there has to be only one unknown. By definition, they have to provide you with everything except one thing. So all of these problems are only going to have one unknown. That means that conservation momentum isn't particularly interesting because they can't tell you that much. In the case of this problem, it's going to be, what, 5 times 10. That's the momentum of the first car. Plus 0, because the other car is not moving. If it's not moving, there's no momentum. And after the collision, and this is probably the only time I'll write it like this, it's going to be 5 times V plus 10 times V. I usually don't write perfectly inelastic collisions like this. 
Because in a perfectly inelastic collision, it's kind of like the two objects have merged and become one object. They have a combined mass that is now greater. But they also have the same velocity. So I will almost always jump right to that. But I'll be nice and indicate that there are two objects that each have individual momentum, and that's how I would write it initially. That has to equal 50, which means that the final velocity has to be 5 thirds meters per second. No, it doesn't. Mr. Shelton can't do math. Don't write that. It's not 5 thirds. It's 10 thirds. 50 divided by 15. 10 thirds meters per second. 3.3. .3. Now, just so you guys know, that's not going to be the thing you're going to have to do in a test. That's going to be like step A. And then there's going to be step B, C, D. And you know, understand how that's going to be, right? This to me is worth like two or three points. And that's about it. Then they're going to go through and they're going to ask some follow-up questions. Here are the likely follow-up questions you should be able to do. And I shouldn't have to teach right now, but I will. Follow-up question number one. What was the impulse experienced by car one? So my follow-ups almost always be to first get you to think about impulse. This problem was about momentum, but car one had a change in momentum. So the impulse of car one, impulse of car two. I would expect you to be able to calculate that. Now, now I'm building towards something, but don't get too worried about this. Car one, did it speed up or slow down? Slow, slow down. It probably has a negative impulse because its momentum got smaller. Car two clearly sped up. It probably has a positive impulse. But I would make you do this so you can show that the total change in impulse equals zero. You will find out. It has to be true that the momentum of the system is constant. If one object's momentum changed, the other one changed an equal amount. That has to be true in all collisions. Look, you are so easy to trick on your multiple choice tests. Write that down. Because I'm going to ask you questions about the change in momentum of an object versus a system. And you know I'm going to do it in such a way as to try and trick you. But these objects all experienced an impulse. But the impulse for the system is zero. So be aware of the difference. Individual objects can have an impulse and still have a conserved momentum for the system. The next follow-up question will be about looking at the energy lost in a collision. I will have you calculate the kinetic energy after and compare it to the kinetic energy before. That's very common. And then I'll ask ratios or differences. How much energy was lost? What is the ratio of the energy before to the energy after? What is the ratio of the energy lost to the energy after? There's all sorts of questions like that. You should note that the energy lost is the kinetic energy after minus the kinetic energy before. That's the energy lost. This should always be negative in all collisions. Because the final energy, the final kinetic energy, will be less than the initial kinetic energy. These are inelastic collisions where we know some of the kinetic energy was transformed into something else. So I'll ask how much. This over here, they're very similar. Complicated there it is. But if the wagon, say, has a mass of 5 kilograms and is rolling at 2 meters per second, after a while the wagon will begin to fill with water and therefore will become more massive. And so what's going to happen to its velocity? Is the wagon going to speed up or slow down as it becomes more massive? 
Yeah. With every raindrop that strikes the wagon, the wagon has to accelerate that raindrop, which means it's going to slow down the wagon. The first thing to note is that the fact that the raindrops are falling vertically doesn't affect the problem. If they're falling vertically, they have no horizontal momentum. Their vertical momentum will be stopped by the wagon. But it doesn't affect the motion of the wagon, except in that the mass of the wagon increases. So a likely question would be, how much water does the wagon have to collect for its velocity to become half a meter per second? That's not an uncommon question, but that is a perfectly inelastic collision question. It doesn't seem like it is, but it is. The momentum of the system before is just the momentum of the wagon, five times two. This has to be equal to the momentum of the wagon after, which is five times 0.5, plus the mass of the water times its velocity of 0.5. The water gets accelerated to 0.5 meters per second. Momentum still has to be conserved, so we could figure out how much water has to fill the wagon in order to slow the wagon down to half a meter per second. Do you see how this is the same question? But they'll do that kind of thing to try and trick you. This is exactly the same as the truck and the sand question or the truck and the load question, where they'll have a truck rolling underneath a, you know, a, there's all sorts of stuff, a, a box or a dirt machine or some, something like that, so that the flatbed truck is going to be burdened with a load that's gonna be dropped into the back of the truck. The assumption that the load has no horizontal momentum before this box is dropped, and that after the box is dropped, it's now a part of the truck system. So we're gonna ask, you know, how fast is the truck going after the huge load is dropped into the flatbed? It's not a particularly interesting question. These are all perfectly inelastic collisions, and they're all done the exact same way by setting the momentum of the system before equal to the momentum of the system after. So don't be concerned that the block was dropped. It's only about the horizontal momentum in each one of these cases that matters. Now, I know you won't write this down, but you should, because if this were me and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to think, if I wanted to think what an AP person would do, the first thing they would do because we've seen this, is they would talk about a case we've never heard of before. And they've never asked this question, but what if the, we live in Florida, we know the rain can come in sideways. Would that affect the answer? We all know that it should, yeah. If the rain's coming in sideways, then the rain droplets have a horizontal momentum when they hit the car. They are going to add that horizontal momentum to the system. So the first thing that you should be able to do is think outside of these problems. The last, so again, in a problem like this, this is still a perfectly inelastic collision. The box was dropped on this larger slab below it. The little box slides along the back of the, the, the larger slab. We know that there's a force of friction pushing this way on that box and a force of friction pushing this way on that box. Friction does the impulse. And there's two equal and opposite impulses here. But you could use that to figure out how far back the box slides. I'm not, I don't think they'd ask that here in a calculated way, but they might ask it in a qualitative way. I could see it on a multiple choice. A couple years ago, this is foreshadowing for your test, meaning this is on your test. They did this question like this, where they had a, a raft floating on the water. And a 
the guy was standing here on the raft. Or was it? It doesn't matter, but I'll put him here on the raft. He walks this way. And they ask what happens. And they ask it in a quantitative manner and a qualitative manner. If the guy begins to walk to the left, what happens to the raft underneath him? Yeah, it doesn't stay in place. It moves to the right. Now, how much it moves compared to him will depend upon how massive he is compared to the raft. They will be related. The momentum of the system before he begins to move is zero. So the momentum of the system after he starts moving still has to be zero. So these are all conservation of momentum style questions. Now, every one of the ones I've showed you so far has been a perfectly inelastic collision. So let's take a look at just standard inelastic collisions. They are less interesting because you'll see why they kind of have to tell you a lot more. The most common are the bullets and, you know, being fired through blocks of wood. They're really common. You have the before case, the bullet, maybe 20 grams fired at, you know, 150 meters per second. Strikes a block of wood that is one kilogram. Now, understand something here. If I ask what happens, you would be unable to answer that question. And the reason why is without knowing what's going to go on during that collision, there's too many unknowns. Let's assume the bullet passes through the block of wood. There's no reason to know whether it did or not. But let's say the bullet passes through the block of wood. So now the block of wood is moving, MB, velocity B, and the bullet is moving, MB, well, I can't use B. So we'll stick with B for block and, I don't know, what will I use for bullet? I'm gonna use P, projectile. There, take none of your ideas into account and I'll just use my own. Now, if you're gonna use conservation of momentum, we know the momentum before the collision. It's 0 0.02 kilograms for the projectile times 150. That's the momentum of the system. After the collision, there's the momentum of the projectile, 0 0.02 times the velocity of the projectile, plus there's the momentum of the block, one kilogram times the velocity of the block. In a standard inelastic collision, you would be done. There's nothing you can do here because we don't know either of these velocities. You see, and this is the important detail, in an inelastic collision, momentum is conserved, but that only generates one equation, which means there can only be one unknown. So they gotta tell you stuff. They gotta tell you something about one of these two objects in order for you to have a reasonable shot, shot at figuring out an answer. So they can't just say the bullet you know, emerges from the other side without saying the bullet emerges from the other side at a velocity of 50 meters per second. Well, now they've told you something. Now you can figure out what happened, right? You can drop in the 50 here and figure out how, you know, what happened to the block of wood. But they're gonna have to tell you something in order to make that happen. They're gonna have to give you another piece of information so that you only have one unknown. I don't wanna do 10 of these as an example. I really wanna show you the final case. But would you like to see more examples of inelastic collisions that look like this? Because the bullet can do only three things pass through, stick to, or bounce off. 
and you've covered all three possibilities. And you don't have to know which happens. The math will tell you the answer. Remember, we've assumed in all of these that this direction is positive. In that assumption, if you got a velocity that works out to be negative, it must be traveling in the opposite direction. Now, don't be complacent. I want to be very, very clear that, although I'm not cutting this one, where I told you how fast the bullet emerged, you could find this velocity and then be asked if the system was elastic or not. If you're asked to prove if your collision is elastic, which is the most likely thing that could be asked, you would want to compare the kinetic energy on this side with the kinetic energy on this side and see if they are equal. That's how you can tell whether a collision is elastic, by comparing the energy after the collision. That is the most likely way they will ask about elastic collisions on the exam, by asking you to demonstrate whether it is one or not, not having you solve for a predicted answer. And I would ask you, after you release the spring, how fast are the boxes going? Because after we release the spring, both boxes are gonna be pushed by the spring. So box one is gonna be pushed to the left, while box two, pushed to the right. The spring just falls between them on the ground. This is gonna be the mass of box two times the velocity of box two. This is gonna be the mass of box one times the velocity of box one. What does their sum have to equal? Well, what was the momentum of the system before the spring was released? Say it again. That's right, this has to equal zero. If they weren't moving before the, the spring was released, then the momentum of the system was zero before the spring was released. The momentum has to stay the same, so now the net momentum still has to be zero. This problem doesn't look like a collision, but it is. And it's a collision that conserves energy. It's not an elastic collision, mind you. Just energy is conserved. We know that from the prior unit. The spring had energy before, so there's elastic potential energy before, and now there's kinetic energy in both boxes after. So this problem conserves energy, and it also conserves momentum. This is within our abilities to do. It's hard, but it's within our abilities to do. We would say that the energy was 1 half k x squared before, and now the energy is 1 half mv squared plus one-half mv squared. So I can set these equal to each other. So now I have two different ways to work through the problem. Probably I could have two unknowns then. You find a velocity after the spring is released. This is question number three, I think, in the homework is what you said. Question number two in the homework? All right, question number two in the homework. So. The momentum before the collision is mv for this cart plus m times one-half v for that cart. That's before the collision. I know there's no numbers, but let's not get thrown off by that. I think it seems to me that the only thing that could possibly happen is the carts are still moving to the right after the collision. Doesn't seem, but it doesn't matter. I'm just going to put vt as the velocity. And if it works out that my answer is negative, then somehow they are going the other direction. After the collision, they have a combined mass, oops. After the collision, they have a combined mass of 2m. That okay with you guys? And have velocity vt. So now we're asked to find the velocity after the collision. So let's get our terms added up on the left side. 
I have mv plus one half v mv. That is three halves mv, or one and a half mv, or 1.5 mv. The other side is two mvt. So the first thing I would do is cancel out the m's, which is good. Don't need the m in the answer. I'm gonna divide by two and get that vt equals one half times three halves V, which is three fourths V. That should be the answer. Three fourths V or 0.75 times V. Bring every possible example, there's just no way to. There are cases where you'll have like, they almost always do a football thing where two guys are running at each other and there's gonna be a tackle involved. They'll say the 80 kilogram guy is going at 1.5 meters per second and the 70 kilogram guy is going at one meter per second. They collide. Now, you don't know what happens in this collision. You don't know if they're moving to the left or to the right in this collision. So I'm just gonna assume they're moving to the right. Let's go draw an arrow the bigger guy's direction, I'm gonna assume that that's it. They might ask how fast they're moving immediately after the collision. What makes this problem one that is harder is that we do need to remember that momentum is a vector. This is still a perfectly inelastic collision, they stuck together. But I need to now deal with the fact that one guy has a positive velocity while the other guy has a negative velocity. He's moving in the opposite direction, therefore his velocity needs to be made negative. And that's gonna equal their combined mass, because they are now traveling together with one velocity. If I work this out and it's positive, then they're moving in the direction of the first guy. If I work this out and it's negative, they're not moving in the direction of the, the other guy. You just need to make sure that you're dealing with direction. Prior example. That one. All right. Now there's one other type of collision that we have not discussed. And the reason is because it's called an elastic collision. There really aren't elastic collisions in nature very much. If you ever hear a collision, then it wasn't elastic because elastic collisions conserve momentum and kinetic energy. Elastic collisions conserve momentum and kinetic energy. If you hear it, then it didn't conserve energy. It converted energy to sound. So there really aren't elastic collisions in nature much. They only occur at like the atomic level. But the reason why a test writer might want to have an elastic collision as part of the test comes right down to test writing issues. If I have a two kilogram ball that strikes a three kilogram ball at a speed of five meters per second. And I tell you the collision is elastic. I don't think anybody in the room probably would, would um, argue with the fact that the three kilogram ball has to go to the right. The two kilogram ball, I don't know, it could bounce off. I don't really know the answer. Even right now in this example, I don't know what would happen when we solve this. I made up the numbers on the spot without calculating the answer ahead of time. But if I tell you the collision is elastic, then I am telling you that the momentum is conserved. So two times five plus three times zero has to equal two times V1 plus three times V2. 
That's the momentum part, but that doesn't tell me the answer. I can't get the answer from this. But by saying it's elastic, I am also saying the kinetic energy is conserved. Folks, I've said that four times. Notice I've never failed to write to say the word kinetic energy is conserved. I'm saying that very clearly in elastic collisions. In elastic collisions, the kinetic energy is also conserved. So I have a momentum conservation equation and a kinetic energy conservation equation. This generates two equations and two unknowns. It can be solved. You can find an answer. It's tedious, as you can imagine. It involves squares, which is hard. And there's only one way to do it with the math you guys have. In fact, I think there's only one way to do it. You have to solve this equation for one of the velocities and plug it into this equation. You have to solve the momentum equation because it's not squared and plug it into the energy equation because it is squared. It is the only way to solve it. It is tedious and monotonous. And even with you guys at the peak of your math skills, that's probably 10 minutes of work. 10 minutes of work. So do the reasonableness here. Are they going to put that on a multiple choice test? It's, it's very unlikely that you can put this calculation on a multiple choice test because it takes 10 minutes or so. I want you to look at this and think in your head what it would take for you to solve for V1 and V2. I just don't think it's reasonable that you could do it in less than 10 minutes. Maybe, maybe five if you're really hustling and we're really, really, really good at your math. So is this a multiple choice question? No. A multiple choice question could be to test if your answer is elastic. That could be one, meaning go back, make it obvious. If I have a ball falling through the air, it's going to have a path like this, right? Because we know it's going to be a parabolic. What if another ball is also falling through the air so that it has a path like this? It is likely they will, their paths will cross. They could collide. So there could be this moment just before they collide, where they have a collision. They would both have a horizontal velocity towards each other and a vertical velocity downwards. Their collision will conserve horizontal momentum. But just horizontal momentum, because there's still an external force accelerating them downwards. <coughs> So how do you deal with that? Well, you deal with it just the instant before they touch and the instant after. In that, the momentum is conserved. It's hard to understand these kinds of problems and to know when to use conservation of momentum and when you can't. The momentum of this system is not conserved. Gravity is increasing the velocity of the car, the balls all the time. But just before they collide and just after, the horizontal momentum will be conserved because we're only talking that split second before and the split second after where gravity really hasn't changed the velocity of the system very much. That's why the word instantaneous gets thrown around a lot here. Instantaneous is immeasurably small. That's, that's the definition. It's an immeasurably small amount of time. 